All right. Well, welcome everyone. I am so glad to have you join us. Um, so a little bit about me. I uh, started out um, in IT, never did anything else uh, other than, I guess, Safeway. I was a grocery clerk and doing all those roles. Um, but anyway, I started as a computer lab uh, and shortly out of college, uh, started working for an engineering firm. Um, I had like 17 offices. It's a billion dollar a year uh, revenue organization. So I was there for about five years. Um, brought in on help desk, kind of moved my way up into endpoint engineering um, and did some basic sysadmin work. Uh, 2008 rolled around, and um, we all know how that went. Uh, engineering sector was hit pretty hard, uh, and there was no opportunities really for me to move uh, up or get any kind of raises or anything. Um, the amount of things that I was doing, uh, you know, shouldn't have been expected from like a help desk level position. So um, we wanted to uh, settle down, get a home, build a family uh, in the Portland area. We couldn't afford anything, so I started looking around and uh, landed a job at the school district in 2011. Um, Started out as a Windows uh, client admin or architect, whatever, um, and quickly uh, within the first year replaced our email system. Um, since I knew the most about Exchange and all the other fun stuff in Office 365, I became the admin of that. Uh, took over Azure or built up Azure, I guess. Um, and then later our G Suite admin left, so I inherited 32,000 Chromebooks at the time. Um, and we're now up to about 56,000 uh, in there. So kind of migrated from client to more cloud related stuff. Um, during that tenure, a little over five years ago, we uh, got a bond to build a bunch of new high schools and some other stuff, $680 million bond. Um, we had a roofing vendor who um, was compromised and then uh, exchanged some emails. And uh, through that, we realized how um, little in the way of security measures that we had taken. Uh, we felt like we'd done some basic security um, and kind of tuned things to where they were supposed to be, but there was a lot that was missing because we just didn't understand or know. Uh, so that started our security journey uh, much earlier than I think most school districts. Um, and so at that point, it became part-time responsibility and then about two and a half years ago, it became a full-time responsibility for me. I was the first full-time security position in the state of Oregon. Um, we have roughly 42,000 students, 7,000 staff, uh, about 60 uh, locations, 52 square miles. Um, so we're just barely smaller than Portland Public School or Salem Kaiser. Um, we're constantly fighting with them as far as who has the highest enrollment. Um, and I think that all three of us are kind of placed in the top 200 or so uh, size school districts in the nation. Um, but then there's others like Miami-Dade or uh, LAUSD or, um, you know, NYC, which is 1.1 million students. They're just, that scale is, it's, it's hilarious. Um, they're basically Amazon at that point. So some important things to know about me. Um, I love context. Um, I grew up fairly sheltered. I never got the jokes about like pop culture and stuff. Um, and so that kind of built in me this um, wanting to understand why people made the decisions that they made or uh, wanting to be able to make the most informed decisions. So I, I love data and I love diving into that. Um, so my hope for you is that I can give you some better context around security, um, the challenges that we have in education, uh, kind of where we're at. Uh, where we need to improve and, and what you might be able to do to help with that as well. Um, so my big uh, takeaway that I'd like for you to have is um, our, we're in a very privileged position uh, to be a larger school district. Um, we actually have IT. Uh, and so when we take a look at the um, districts that are about 50,000, 40 to 50,000 students and larger, they sometimes have a full-time dedicated security position. Anything smaller than that, most of them that I know of do not have a security position. Uh, they have some operations people, um, sysadmins maybe who's uh, split responsibilities in security, um, but it's a completely different beast as I've learned over the last two and a half years um, being in that role. So. Uh, we operate almost at an enterprise scale, or we do, um, but we very much function like a small business, <laughs> uh, or we, we act in that way. So um, as a result, like not all schools have the same resources, uh, whether that's funding, whether that's talent, um, or uh, any of those things. Um, and most of the time, we are way behind a lot of other industries. Uh, as a result, the parents and teachers uh, or students, they get very different results, uh, depending or experiences, depending on where they're at. Um, if they're in an affluent area, they may be very heavy in technology and have plenty of funding for stuff. But if they're in a more rural uh, area or um, more um, lower income, then they may not have as many opportunities. Uh, and so in a little bit, we'll, we'll kind of dive into what that looks like for some of them because it's uh, uh, very eye-opening as you start to look at the data. 
So um, the emphasis of all of that is really just how important our community is. Um, whether you're in your local community or whether the schools are involved in some form of community where they're helping um, build best practices. Um, and that goes for schools as far as teachers and what their pedagogy looks like and, um, and from that level, as well as IT and what that should look like. Um, what does ed tech look like? And then, um, you know, we're focusing at OPSEC EDU, we're focusing on security and building up a lot of operational people um, to focus on security and, and better understand that narrative. So, um, final note before we begin, uh, I am not speaking on behalf of my district. Um, I work with a lot of different districts. I'm trying to aggregate a lot of that information, kind of average it out so you get a better view. Um, but keep in mind that majority of districts don't have IT staff. So I um, am only interacting with those who are privileged enough to have that. So my views will probably be a bit more optimistic than its actual reality. So um, just kind of let that settle in there. Um, so I love Legos. Um, my son uh, absolutely loves Legos too. So he helped me build this one day, which is so fun. Um, there's there's a, a lot of things that go wrong as he's building these and they fall apart, it gets really frustrated. Uh, so I'm gonna show this little um, video clip. We love the Lego Master Builders and um, this is about 50 seconds uh, and then I'll, I'll uh, comment on it all now. Hopefully this works. So it's super impressive. Um, if you notice the internal structure, I mean, they're using iron and they're holding everything together in that. Um, we, uh, we're generally lacking the internal structures. Uh, when it's the um, education, uh, a lot of things are, um, let's just make this work, let's just make this work. And so by the time that we build some of these things up, uh, we have no way to support that arm. We have no way to support the book that they're holding um, and the glue just doesn't really hold it together. Um, so I think it's a uh, kind of a fun uh, analogy um, for education, especially the way that we handle technology. We just kind of piecemeal things together bit by bit until all of a sudden we built something that can't sustain itself. Um, so some people like to call it technical debt uh, or, you know, um, anyway, we're, uh, many districts found themselves in a difficult spot when we went to this. And I, I can't find the reference. I had it open last night, but about 6% of districts say that they actually support remote uh, working. Um, so teleworking, uh, and that's just in general. They have staff who telework. So um, when we were suddenly forced into this, hey, now everybody's going to be working from home. The vast majority of districts had no way to do that. They didn't have VPN. They didn't have experience doing any of this stuff. So um, that's really left us in a, in a difficult bind. Um, and a lot of it has been around the equity piece. Of teachers are stuck in classrooms, and we need to be physically available to help them. Um, which is understandable. Uh, it's nice to be able to walk up and ask somebody for help. And so um, this has been a very, very big uh, shift <laughs> for education. Um, and so hopefully this will, this will give us an overview of what an average school district looks like. Um, in the United States, I took all of, these, uh, all of this data from the um, NCES uh, ed.gov. You can see the link down there. Um, but we have 50.8 million students in the United States, um, and that covers across about 99,000 public institutions. So I'm not um, talking at all about like the charters of the uh, private schools or anything else, just the public school system in general. Um, so when we averaged all that out, and we said that it was basically 5.6 schools per district is the normal average. However, if you take a look at the largest uh, school district, the top 100, we have about 155.6 schools per each. Um, for us, I, I think it's getting close to about 60. Um, so the, the 100 smallest, though, they only average like 1.6 schools. Um, you don't have an IT person. 
with those. So I guess that's kind of my primary emphasis is we're just so uh, privileged and, and uh, to be able to have those. So the ones who don't have IT, how do they actually get their HR systems and all those kinds of things? They, they rely on um, sometimes an MSP, but generally they have a uh, service district. So here in the Pacific Northwest, we call them ESCs, uh, Electronic Service District, I think. Our education service district. There we go. CSEs in some places, ISEs in others. Um, but these service districts are just super critical um, to all these smaller districts, especially in the rural areas. They provide internet connectivity, um, even to the large districts they do for us here. Um, they provide the content filtering. They provide um, all kinds of services that, um, by pooling the funds from all these smaller districts, they can then afford to um, fund a handful of IT, like a, a legal counsel, or some of these other services that are very difficult to provide or pay for. Um, the, the hard part that comes into that is a lot of these are remote locations. Um, you have juvenile uh, facilities, um, detention facilities. So some of these aren't actually networked in a way where they can uh, manage them remotely. So there's a lot of travel involved for the ESDs or, or these service districts. Um, and that makes it really hard for them to scale properly too. Um, so the funding is, is hard and it's, it's just hard to get out there and do these things. So, and again, I'll just highlight that most of the districts that I know of that are under 50,000 students just don't have a dedicated uh, full-time security role. So we're relying on some operations people who are constantly putting out fires to figure out how to also secure stuff at the same time. And knowing what vulnerability management systems look like, they, it's just not even on the radar. It's a, that's, uh, um, yeah, not something that we get to enjoy. So, uh, let's see, oh, uh, something I, I forgot to mention, uh, it's partly why teachers uh, tend to go out and be their own IT. Um, they're actually trained to like, oh, here's how you build a website. I remember I was actually in ele elementary ed for two years um, of my college education. Um, and part of that was how do we build a website? How do we, um, you know, teach based on these applications or, or whatever that might be? Um, and I think that that is still uh, a common thing that it's, it's an expectation teachers are going to take care of their own technology. And unfortunately, it translates even into places where we want to govern it and we want to control the privacy aspects of software that teachers are using and we want them to understand what FERPA and COPPA laws actually are. Um, it's just very hard to disseminate that information. And um, oftentimes IT is backlogged. And so, I mean, from an IT perspective, we do a poor job of supporting teachers too. Um, and so that makes it really hard for them to, uh, like, oh, I, I can do this so much faster than IT. And so they kind of go around. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how Zoom um, kind of affected that. But again, going back to the Lego analogy, let's look at our building blocks. We actually have, like, several different threat profiles, uh, we call it, of, um, or how do we relate with these different user groups that we have to support? Because it's different than um, a lot of businesses are where they may have their internal employees and um, then they have their customers. Um, but for us, uh, like students actually tend to use computers more than even the teachers do. Um, and our internet usage, we've got a 10 gig pipe that's constantly at eight and a half um, gig in use. And they're, they're very, very heavy in technology use. Oftentimes they have two to three devices. So anytime on our network, we've got over 100,000 devices. Um, on just our wireless. Um, so they're, they're a very difficult uh, group to work with. So you, you range from age five all the way up to 19, um, sometimes older for special ed um, instances. Uh, so <laughs> you get a pretty wide uh, degree of, okay, what does our content filtering look like for all these different levels? What is our um, concern about uh, attempted hacking or uh, kids uh, bullying one another or um, all these different things that we need to implement to monitor and ensure safety of the students? Um, it changes as they progress through school. So we have multiple sets of things that we're concerned about through uh, the life cycle of having those students there. Not to mention, we deal with a lot of students coming in and out of the district. And so, uh, you know, going through the processes of onboarding and enrolling and then deprovisioning and, um, oh, I, I forgot this data. Um, all those things add a lot of support. Um, and so it's uh, hard to focus on, in, on implementing new things, especially around security. We're so busy trying to service everybody and take care of all the requests that are coming in. Um, so we have certified is what we call them, teachers. Um, they have a license, uh, licensed staff. Um, they are absolutely wonderful. They love their kids. Um, and a lot of times they just want to get things done. So what they'll do is they'll find this really neat online service um, that they love. And so, or they, it works better than what IT may have provided. They'll go out and they'll create accounts for all of their students. Um, the problem is, is that application may not be uh, within our guidelines for privacy. It may not be FERPA compliant. It may not be, um, you know, fill in the blank. 
Um, so there's a lot of uh, how do we communicate the information that they need to know. And if you look at these smaller districts where they don't have IT and they have absolutely no clue, like this isn't something that's on their radar. They just go and sign up for the stuff that they want. Um, and so I, I feel like there's a responsibility of the vendors who are ma making ed tech, uh, you know, software that's targeted towards education. They really need to be um, taking this more seriously about how do we onboard uh, teachers, especially if they don't have an, an IT admin at their school, it's going to help them. So um, classified uh, is our support staff. Uh, that ranges for all the normal business units that you would have in any other organization. So you have your HR, your business. Uh, we actually have some additional ones um, that are like transportation. Um, so federally funded and they, they um, keep track of where all the students are and um, monitoring the bus routes and all that kind of stuff, communicating with parents on, hey, your student wasn't picked up on this bus, um, all of those components that go into it. Um, we also have nutrition services, um, so they're you know taking care of all the meals for the kids through this. Nutrition services is still working; they're still making meals, and then the kids drive through and they pick them up, and it, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so frontline workers there. Um, the administrators, managers, they're actually really small, usually three percent or less of the um, of the whole organization. Uh, and then volunteers and guests actually end up being even more than that. Uh, we do background checks on all of our volunteers. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that's industry standard, um, but we do uh, go through those processes. Um, volunteers are wonderful, and I don't think that we could even operate without them. Um, and so, especially if you have uh, experience in um, technology and stuff, uh, and you're in an area where they don't have a lot of IT support, um, it's just a wonderful gift to be able to uh, step in and offer help to them. Um, and then we do, uh, for our district, we go with some vendors, not a whole lot. We've tried to remove as many of them as possible. Um, Liability-wise, as well as just having the in-house knowledge um, saves a lot of headaches. Um, but a lot of the smaller districts, they absolutely have to rely on vendors, and everything is done by vendors. Um, and one of the unfortunate truths of education is we get discounts, um, and that discount usually means you get the new guy. Um, so the uh, level of support that we oftentimes get is kind of on the lower end of um, of the spectrum from those companies. So uh, moving into Zoom, um, I had this wonderful, <laughs> I, I don't know, I expected 10 people to read it, just a little bit of a rant, um, and it kind of blew up. And I really appreciate Matthew. Um, he was super kind um, in the way that he handled it and, and uh, didn't make fun of me or anything. Um, but basically, uh, you know, a lot of people looked at the NYC decision to uh, to basically get rid of or ban the use of Zoom within their, um, their set of schools was uh, viewed pretty negatively. Um, I still don't necessarily agree with the decision because I, I, I'm concerned about the impact that it is on the uh, teachers, not so much the security or privacy concerns. Um, all those, those are very, very real. Um, I think it'd be helpful if we kind of walked through uh, what the acquisition process looks like normally um, for education, um, kind of the thought process that we go through and just keeping in mind that the processes that we go through, while not perfect, are probably better than um, you might experience a lot of smaller districts and some other larger ones probably handle it better than we do. Um, so just kind of a, a general overview, I think, um, so you can get a good feel for uh, kind of the decisions that we make. Um, so if we take a look at onboarding, um, one of the difficulties around Zoom especially was that um, they offered free upgraded basic accounts and they removed the 40 minute restriction. What they didn't specify was that it had to be tied to an education tenant in order for it to be FERPA compliant. There's these controls um, with FERPA that says, hey, um, the data that's on there can't be mined, can't be sold, can't be um, all this other stuff. Um, and we, uh, if you signed digital permissions for your student, we as a school district, we can actually provision those accounts. Um, and we're allowed to do that on behalf of the parent um, because we're the acting custodian, right? Um, so that gets us around the COPPA laws that we have that say, hey, under the age of 13, you need to get parental consent and all this other stuff. So we're totally fine to uh, create the accounts um, from that perspective, assuming that the teacher has requested permission from the parents or the district has. Um, and some, like our district, it's a blanket uh, digital permission slip um, that says, hey, we can create any kind of online accounts because we have so many services. Um, there are others who do it on a per service basis, uh, which does make it really, really hard. Um, I feel bad for the students who are in some things, but then not in others because their parents don't like a specific product or they don't like Microsoft or they don't like Google or, you know, these different things. So um, a lot of things get very fractured very quickly. 
Um, so anyway, the, the basic problem that we had here was teachers were uh, signing up for accounts, whether it was with their personal email and then creating accounts for their students, which then weren't actually, you know, covered. So there's just, there's a lot of different moving components in there. So when we bring software and we take a look at what is the, uh, what is the privacy concerns and um, are they compliant with all the laws that we have to take care of? Um, so as far as privacy goes, we work through um, a4l.org. Uh, access for Learning, they're an absolutely wonder, a wonderful organization trying to standardize what a privacy policy looks like for ed tech. Um, and so the more people that kind of join in with them, the more leverage they have to kind of force these ed tech vendors to have appropriate privacy policies. And I will tell you, over the last couple of years, we've seen a really, really good increase in um, what that looks like. People are actually putting privacy policies on their website, which didn't exist before. Some of them are even putting security policies now on their website, which is a huge, a huge boon. Um, so one of the uh, difficulties that we had with Zoom, and we've been a Zoom district for a couple of years. It was brought in by um, our teaching and learning, and they only used it teacher to teacher. It was for professional development. Um, during that time, we didn't really struggle at all with Zoom bombing type issues. Um, once you know everybody started using it, people started to figure that out, and then of course kids wanted to do that, and so then we started adding passwords, and and it's just these layers upon layers upon layers. So it's it rapidly trying to learn the management platform um, was really difficult. Uh, one of the other things, Zoom's admin console does not really have um, uh, very many bulk options. Uh, our our API currently has a limit um, of nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine users. I haven't been able to do a whole lot of stuff against it because um, we're we're restricted and we've had a support ticket open for weeks with them and they still have not gotten around to our support tickets. Um, so it's just these compounding issues. I can only imagine trying to manage something for 1.1 million students when you have to sit there and click through a console for all of these users. So um, looking at the controls that they have around the, the security, around the privacy, around managing, um, it makes sense as to why they would say, yeah, we're, we're just going to scrap the whole thing because we can't fix it. And we're just going to force everybody to move over to something that actually has uh, enterprise grade management tools that we can really manage and, and set up properly. Um, so we are actually in that same process of moving over to Teams. Um, however, we decided to take a, a little bit more of a um, staggered approach. So moving, you know, the central staff, the support staff, all of them into it first, building things out and rolling individual schools at a time and helping them kind of configure what their classrooms look like and scheduling and um, all the complexities that go into that, helping them build that out. So we're, we're slowly rolling instead of just cutting it off and affecting everybody. Um, and the reason that I go that direction, um, I have a lot of empathy. Um, I, I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old and um, they're, they're wonderful, but watching my daughter on her Zoom class with her, with her friends, uh, like she, uh, you could read it on her, like, oh my gosh, my friends, I totally miss them and I didn't even realize it. And she's like almost breaking down, not, not understanding the implications of that. And I think there's so much emotional and psychological impact that the kids are going through right now that we don't necessarily see. They're running around and playing, but they, they don't recognize it themselves. Um, and I just, I have a hard time. Uh, hey, it's not secure. It's not private. Let's just like, you know, not have these virtual classrooms. It's actually really important in my opinion to the kids. And there are some things that do end up trumping those in my mind when I, when I have to weigh, what do we, what do we value here? So I'm um, looking at alternatives, just kind of a fun little side note here, because it what has been brought up like, Hey, look at Jitsi. Hey, look at big blue button. Hey, look at all these things. And um, I try to think about what does the infrastructure look like if I had to deploy this out? Yeah, sure. I, I get that they're in containers. Um, I can spin up a whole bunch of containers and then how much is the cost on that? What kind of infrastructure did I already have to have in place in order to do that? Um, I guess I could play, uh, pay for cloud hosting of this stuff, but oh my gosh, now we're spending out you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to support something like this. Um, I, it's part of the reason that we're moving to Teams. Microsoft does give it to us for free um, indefinitely. We don't actually ever pay for it. And they do have a lot of educational um, components built in that nobody else outside of education ever gets to see. Um, they have these like classroom notebooks and a whole, I, I'd call it a lightweight LMS uh, built in. Um, but a lot of uh, people in enterprise, they never actually see those features, the, the uh, security packages that are designed for, um, you know, your primary and secondary students that limit their abilities to do different things. Uh, they never see those, pro uh, those security policies. So anyway, we're migrating over to those. I don't know that there are alternatives for Zoom. Um, that are like, you know, the free open source, or uh, if you're really concerned about the privacy uh, aspect of things like data being mined out of Google Meet or um, whatever that might be. 
Um, so a little side note I will mention um, on that as well is Google, uh, Microsoft, others that do provide on a, on a scale like they do for us, um, as far as our agreements go, um, Google does not mine the student email. They don't mine um, the data and different things. They, they do have uh, specific policies, privacy policies that they've agreed to. Um, and their hand was forced probably nine or 10 years ago by a lot of the states in saying that, hey, if you're going to provide this to us, um, you can't use that data for these purposes. And um, they've held to that pretty well. So um, moving off of Zoom, um, kind of cover the, the struggles that we've had in trying to transition from on-premise where we made all of our investments and spent, you know, the vast majority of our, our uh, resources um, building out a wireless infrastructure that can support 100,000 um, users, uh, all the networking, the switching, the, you know, um, the firewall that's providing our security filtering and um, all that. Uh, it's not a trivial task to suddenly move all of that into how do I filter a device I just sent home with a kid, like it's an iPad. I, we didn't, we were filtering on print, the iPads never left, but now that we're handing them out to kids, like we're, we're required to content filter, um, and we're just giving to kids devices. So um, we had to really rethink that. Um, love, we're fortunate, again, we have IT staff. Um, so we're able to spin up the VPN. We can push a VPN profile out and get all these things pulled back in and managed. And um, so we're still actually working through that even now of uh, we've deployed VPN, but how do we uh, re-architect all of our, um, you know, the segmentations of our network, preventing people from accessing things they're not supposed to, right? Um, because in order to just get classes back up and functioning, it, it, hey, just let's open it up, make sure everything's working, we'll monitor the firewall and start implementing rules. So we're still bringing a lot of that back in. Um, and then for managing all of our endpoints, we have three different admin consoles. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of fun. But, uh, if I come to our oh, other one, Come and take a look at this. Uh, our admin. Uh, well, I guess I lost them all. That is fun. So uh, anyway, we've got like fifty-two thousand Chromebooks in our G Suite, but then we've got, uh, say, our uh, other one here. And sorry, no. now everybody's in the master. Uh, so we've got, you know, 23,000 uh, iOS devices, another 10,450, but we've got three different MDMs, I guess, is what I was really trying to get at. Um, these things are uh, managing a massive amount of devices, but all of it was on-premise. So now we have to make this decision, do we want to expose that to the internet and have those risks? Do we want to extend it out via the VPN, or are we going to somehow shift all of this stuff back up into cloud? Um, so that gets to be a really tricky conversation. Um, same with our phone systems, we have a limited amount of dial-in numbers. We never really wanted classrooms disrupted by, um, uh, you know, parents calling into the teacher in the middle of class. So teachers never had dial-in numbers. Well, now they're at home and we want the parents to be able to call back the teacher if they miss the phone call or whatever it is, and we don't have enough dial-in numbers. Um, our phone system's never been exposed to the internet either, so that people could actually like uh, connect in via the apps. Um, and it's something that I've fought against because in general, voice over IP systems aren't the most secure software. Um, they're usually years behind um, as far as a security model goes. So, so we're, we're giving up a lot as we're, we keep exposing more and more out to the internet. One of the other difficulties that we've noticed is business processes. Um, my DLP has been catching so many socials and credit cards and reconciliations for P cards and all these other things, because instead of being able to just uh, print it out or hand it off to somebody there inside of the office like they normally would or in an office mail, now they just you know default to, hey, I'm just going to email this. Well, now it's sitting in somebody's email, and if they get compromised, that attacker is going to dump the mailbox, and now how our credit card? Um, so we've been you know, communicating out with staff this whole time that, hey, don't don't send this type of information, uh, you know, via email. It, they still attempt to do it, and the email still sits there. And so we have to keep going back through and cleaning all this stuff up. Um, other decision processes that we have for vetting software or saying, hey, this is going to go through, that we're going to ask them to sign our privacy policy, and then we'll use our automation tools to provision accounts for them. Those processes went right out the window. Like, this is a pandemic. I can just sign up for anything I need, and then I'll just create accounts for my kids, and they can just go. And I gotta imagine this is even worse the smaller of a district that you get. Like, everybody's just free for all, and we're just gonna do this. 
Um, from a logistics standpoint, we had like 10,000 Chromebooks that we had to hand out um, in order to be able to allow students who didn't have one. So that meant overnight filling up a form that parents filled out, which then didn't have data validation. Um, so then we're like, you know, resetting students' passwords because they, they don't know what it is. Um, and then trying to communicate that accurately without having the system be abused. Like it is a logistical nightmare um, trying to bring all of that stuff in. And then if I think of my security systems, I have like my uh, CASB and my EDR and my Amherst and all this other stuff that's primarily focused on um, on premise, my SIM. Um, and I'm used to getting all the alerts and everything. And if I look in there, I'm, I'm used to about 300 gigs of data flowing into it. And now I'm getting 50 because uh, nothing's getting used. Everything's all in Google Classroom or it's in Canvas or it's all these online systems that are, uh, you know, they each have disparate and you can't actually tap into them. You have to log into each console and do the audit logs for those things. So uh, it's made that security work a lot harder on top of getting hit with a lot of uh, phishing that we don't normally see. Um, I mean, we, we get a lot, but it has had a significant increase, probably three to four times as much as normal. Um, and a lot of them are better. So my biggest fear, I guess, at this point is with everything being so uh, poorly managed as everybody's taking all their stuff home and they're using the devices as personal devices because now I have it here and I'm just going to use it. You know, what happens when we start school back up and all of these school district staff start bringing devices back in that now have malware on them? Um, and so that's, yeah, it's a scary thought. And I'm really concerned as we bring everything back uh, across the U.S., um, what that's going to end up looking like for us. So, I love the little animation of, um, you know, the, the band, Bertrand. Um, a lot of people just does to nail this, you know, um, to do really well. Um, I expect a lot of failures, uh, and I that we need to stop pretending like we're actually, you know, like we did the first time, or that we are going to. Uh, I think when we're talking about security controls and privacy and all these other, uh, it's important those kind of voice, um, but I expect that they're not going to be done all naturally, and we it will require, you know, additional um, building work there. Um, so. Some ways that you can help, uh, if you do have experience uh, in security and privacy in um, all sorts of other areas, even in business processes, um, whether it's payroll or, or whatever that might be, um, for your, uh, that is what you do for a living, you're really good at it, go talk to your school district, um, go talk to the school, talk to the teacher, uh, find out if there's any way that you might be able to help. Um, and one of the things that I find uh, the most helpful is when it's a project-based, like a very specific thing. Hey, I want to go and take a look at your email configuration. I think that, you know, I, I was able to evaluate it, uh, you know, publicly, right? We're publishing SPF, DCAM, and DMARC, and um, I can view those and say, hey, you have insecure settings. I would love to help you walk through that specific thing. Perfect. Those are great. The open up uh, invitations are, are nice. Um, like, oh, hey, I, you know, I have a, a parent who works at Intel. He's one of their head uh, security engineers. It's wonderful for me to be able to just ping him and ask a question if I'm not sure about something. But it's totally different to offer, hey, I see this one specific need, or in our conversation, I know you have a need, and I can definitely help with that specific thing. Um, it's much more helpful. So if you don't uh, have that expertise, that's totally okay. Um, it's still important that you advocate for the security privacy um, concerns that you have for your kid. And I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the applications they're using and um, question them. Always question them. Uh, I've got a buddy who has uh, investigated a lot of EdTech apps. Um, and they, uh, he's always found something wrong with them um, uh, from a security control standpoint. Um, so none of them are great, um, and some of them have threatened to sue, uh, just trying to tell them about the vulnerabilities that they have because we reverse engineered their software, or they just they don't understand what it is. They don't deal with security researchers. So EdTech is still um, years behind, and it is very difficult to get things cleaned up. Um, so uh, yeah. One of, the, one of the other areas that we can do a better job at, um, encouraging your technical staff um, or any other staff, just like teachers, a lot of times they have their learning groups, their professional learning communities. Um, for IT staff, uh, there's COSIN, which is very geared towards uh, leadership. It is a national thing. Um, A4O is handling privacy stuff very well. They partner. Um, and then we have OPSEC EDU, which I want to plug, um, being the chairman. Um, but we, we build up a lot of people um, to understand security. We invite teachers. We invite um, anybody who's working in education to come in and, and ask questions. Um, and we just love sharing our experiences and thoughts on things. Um, so there are a lot of local associations. Um, I spelled that wrong, but 
Um, we here in the Pacific Northwest have ACPE Northwest. It's a wonderful organization, lots of great leaders, um, a lot of people who are also in POSIN, um, but they host it more for the IT uh, department themselves to communicate with each other and learn best practices and how we're handling automation of all the student accounts because, you know, manually creating thousands of them is not a, a good idea. Um, so some of the other areas, donated, discounted hardware, software services, those are always great. Um, generally, we get stuff that's crazy old, and then we get a, a really hard mix of stuff. Um, so we have, you know, seven different vendors' uh, products, and then being able to manage them appropriately is really, really hard. So if you can do large quantities of just Dell, that's awesome, um, or just HP or whatever. But um, I would also just kind of, before you donate hardware especially, think about what the impact might be for them to be able to manage it. Um, and then donating time next to is just absolutely wonderful. So um, I think that kind of wraps up where I'm at. Not too bad. Uh, 40 minutes. Great, Nathan. That's been incredible. And uh, as usual, you come in under time and with way more knowledge <laughs> than I think anyone uh, can process. But also, you have a really tough job, so that's great. Um, so some of the questions we're getting are obviously about um, alternative technologies, privacy respecting stuff. Um, I'm at least going to start, I think, with sort of a summary question that kind of encapsulates a lot of the questions that we're seeing, um, which is um, municipal governments, right? Town halls, you know, all their meetings where I am, you know, like other cities and states and so on, they have these democratic councils of some kind that are now switching to collaborative platform. Yeah. And um, do you see that creating um, a tension between uh, them and education? Do you think that, that like, these things be included in some way? or Because what I've seen, at least, and, and, and one of the things that I think is starting to happen is, you know, cities will say, well, we have school system admins, they'll just handle it. Uh, and this is way outside the scope of what they're doing. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, um, so like in our area, we actually have Hillsborough School District. Um, they're a smaller district, 20,000 students, roughly. Um, they're doing some wonderful partnership with their, state, uh, with their city. Um, the city is actually going to be providing um, municipal internet um, for them, and they're building that out. I think there's a lot of opportunities to partner um, with them, um, but to shift like a lot of the workload and stuff off to the school districts as admins, there's there's not a lot of them. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the the needs are so unique and different than um, than the local governments are. Um, I, I do, I love helping with our local government. We do interact with them regularly because we actually have a private police force uh, as part of our school district. We're large enough. Um, and so uh, it's, it's kind of cool um, to, to get to talk to them about like how they have their VPN set up and uh, the 911 systems and some of the other police database systems that we have to tie in with and getting to know some of their infrastructure guys. I think it's great to have that dialogue with them um, and how important that is. Um, but yeah, adding workload onto uh, school district staff uh, from the city level is, uh, it's hard. I don't know if that fully answers what you're looking for. I'm just fishing for more knowledge. So whatever you can, <laughs> and you've done well. So, um, you know, I, I kind of uh, just want to make sure um, a lot of people, obviously, for even this summit, they want to go against Zoom, and you you provide a lot of reasons why Zoom is problematic. You talked about all kinds of other ways of doing things. But in general, in your experience, you've been doing this a long time. What do you think this is headed? And, and what I mean by that is we had a sort of a trust the vendor, go with the cloud model before this crisis that we're now in. And then all of a sudden, it sort of flipped. So... Yeah, um, so Zoom did uh, sign our privacy policies, by the way. Um, so the, the question is, is who's actually vetting these privacy policies and are they making sure that they're compliant with them? Um, that, that is a difficult question. So, I mean, uh, I, I think I alluded to it. If you don't have an IT staff, we rely real heavily on hosted solutions, especially people giving us stuff for free. When you get stuff for free, a lot of times you're the product, right? Um, so I do see, and I appreciate Mark's questions about like, 
you know, hey, all this proprietary software and um, none of it's open source and, and uh, we're concerned about data being hoovered up. And I, I agree, it's a huge issue. Um, there are some of our vendors that we, uh, that we deal with um, that we, so go, take a step back, Microsoft, Google, some of the others that I know many people are concerned about, we do have agreements with them where they specifically state in legal terms that we will not, they, they will not use our data in those ways like mining it for advertising and all that kind of stuff. So I know that you can look at the consumer products for a lot of these vendors and say, hey, they have these specific practices. Um, like the telemetry data within Windows is a great example, completely turned off in education. Like we can set it to zero, we can send it all to ourselves if we really wanted to set up the server and have all the analytics data sent to our server instead. Um, so all the controls and capabilities are given uh, to most of the stuff in, in the larger um, companies that are providing technology solutions to schools, Apple, I'll throw Apple in there too. Um, they're really good about respecting privacy of the students and that kind of stuff. Where you start to get into questionable tactics is these, um, uh, you know, they, they've been in the business space for a while and they just kind of throw out this little education on the side. Um, oh, hey, cool, new market. Let's just, you know, throw that out there. And they don't really understand the complexities of uh, the FERPA laws or COPPA or some of the other things. And because it's like this nice enterprise, we love enterprise um, grade software, we're going to go sign up for that because, hey, it scales. It can handle the amount of students that we have. And um, a lot of times there's not a review process that that goes through. So for us personally, we go through a, um, we have specific data privacy policies. We also have some uh, policies as far as like anything that's purchased, we put it into the uh, contract language that they must support a single sign-on. We won't provide access to our LDAP. We will not ever send passwords to them. It's all going to be either sample or OAuth type, uh, you know, it's all going to be token based. And um, we're sending the limited amount of data that we can possibly send. Um, most of it falls under public record information. Um, and generally, we try to just stick to a student ID, which has no mapping back to anything, right? But again, I go back to, we have an IT, um, we have people who actually care, or I shouldn't say actually care, but are aware of the situation with privacy and are advocate, advocating for that. Not all schools have that. Um, so right. I'll, I'll keep harping on that all day. <laughs> so people understand, you know, go talk to your teacher, talk to your school and let them know, hey, I, and, and it's hard um, to not get defensive, right? So it's, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about the privacy of XYZ software and what they might be doing with our student data. Have you ever considered that? Um, is there maybe an alternative that we can use instead? Um, you know, those are, those are great questions, for phrasing it as a question and, and getting them thinking about it and saying, I'd, I'd be willing to take that as a project if you'd let me um, go find something alternative that meets your needs. Because um, I think oftentimes where I can make awesome solutions, I'm terrible at asking, what is your need? And, and then designing it around that. So, yeah. so um, I mean, I, I posited something that there's no easy answer for. But I guess to me, it kind of looks like a lot of school systems are all of a sudden willing to make choices that they would otherwise not make. Um, yeah. And in some... To, to put it mildly, right? Um, and in some cases, that means cloud services, right? And in some cases, that means the exact opposite, right? Let's bring everything in house, trust our IT people, and so on and so forth. And it seems like obviously you have a your school district has a good process, and you go through and you've had. Um, but the area, you know, a lot of these questions are hinging on, and also I've had some teachers, you know, email me specifically, and I don't know exactly what to tell them. But um, states are changing what consent means for K-12, right? Um, so in Connecticut, for example, um, the governor put out some guidance saying, okay, we're going to extend consent to mean any company that signs this privacy pledge. And if they sign this privacy pledge now, that software is something that we can use in the school system. Um, do you see that happening in Oregon? Maybe we're an anomaly or just a Northeast state thing. And if you do or don't, how do you feel about these agreements? And do you see kind of consent changing because of the crisis? Yeah, so um, I do see that happening often. Um, and the states have always done that to a certain extent. I think they're doing it more now as a response uh, to just the sprawl that we're ending up with. Um, so OSPI is Washington's, um, and I know that they signed their uh, stuff with Zoom actually before the state of Oregon did um, by a couple of weeks. 
um, and it just has to do with how they promise to handle the data. Um, I, I would say that a lot of these consumer services, right, they do uh, mine a lot of the consumer data, um, but it's important to ask, hey, in the education variant <laughs> or skew of this product, um, are they also doing those practices? Um, and the school district should know. Um, and I think that's where we oftentimes have a disconnect. Like parents are really concerned. Hey, my kid has a Gmail account and now Google is reading all of my kid's email. Well, not actually if they're under an education tenant, as long as they're using Google apps for education, it's not. Um, but you know, that differentiation is hard to understand outside of IT. Um, and like even the teachers may not recognize that that's how things work. Um, so yes, I do see at the state level, I see a lot of stuff getting reviewed as far as privacy concerns go and kind of blanket signed off for anybody in uh, the state and any school district to basically sign on and just assume that the state has already done the proper vetting. Um, we still request that they sign our data privacy agreement, which we do through A4L. So we have a marketplace where you can go and look up all of the approved applications or um, we also track the applications that were kind of grandfathered for a period of time while we reach out and try to pull those applications back in. Um, and they're providing maybe a unique service for special education services or something else that's harder to replace. Um, and so, you know, getting thousands of teachers to kind of uh, settle on one specific thing is, is a very hard task. Um, and so the organization inside of a, at least within our school district, um, or I should say most, you're gonna have like your top level, right? You've got uh, the departments back in some central or district office. Um, they're supposed to be setting kind of a vision, but then you get out to the schools and they're all their own small little businesses, really. You've got a principal who has a lot of um, leeway, I guess, as far as what they want their stuff to look like. And then you can get down to the classroom level where even the teachers can kind of uh, go and do their own thing like, hey, I did it over at this other school. I had all this tech stack and I really like that better. So now you have that in their classroom. So it gets really jarring for the students to have three different LMSs they sign into and four apps that all do the same thing. And like standardization is a really, really hard uh, topic for, for school districts. So um, we've been trying to use the privacy agreements to kind of rein a lot of that in and kind of get rid of some of the vendors that don't do a good job with that stuff like this one. Uh, we just had this request come through and I'm like, what, what is this? Uh, what? <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just bewildered, but you know, they want these like old apps from 1997 and they're finding this stuff. So the, these are the, the kinds of requests we get occasionally. And, um, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to rein that kind of stuff in. Yeah, so I appreciate it, and uh, the Frank view is huge, and you sharing your screen and showing us what you see is, is gigantic for me. So, um, you know, I've been a sysadmin. I've dealt with a lot of sensitive records, uh, financial records, immigration records, all kinds of stuff that we had to report to the feds and so on. And um, that sometimes uh, caused me to lose sleep, right? Yeah. Uh, but when I look at your job uh, and the amount of students you're dealing with and the scope of what you're dealing with, you know, it's really, really, really huge. Um, I'm worried um, that you and other people who are, are, you know, in charge of security at, at school systems, or if they have a security person, right, um, as you alluded to, um, they're now going to be dealing with contact tracing and cell phones. Um, how do you feel about that? Have you heard any murmurs about that? And where do you think that's going? I do not like, um, primarily because it, it tra traces based off identities, right? Um, I do, uh, like if you look at the partnership that Apple and Google had um, in the way that they are doing contact tracing, um, it does abstract really, really well. Um, I like that design. If we had a, a better way of doing something more along those lines, I'd be willing to at least listen. Um, but the way that they're currently doing stuff, um, I'm, I hate the attendance tracking um, abilities based off Bluetooth LE or whatever other you know mechanisms that we're trying to use, um, apps and other things to track students. Um, and I'm not a fan of those. So I personally fight against anything that is along those lines within my district. But then you can have other districts with completely different leadership, with completely different staff, who uh, don't necessarily think about the privacy implication. They they look their you know um, blinders are on, and they're only focusing on the outcome. We need to be able to do attendance in a way that's not causing cla an eighty person classroom to take you know ten minutes to call roll. So this is just easier for us, and you know 
anyway, um, I, I get that there are some issues, but I don't think that everything is a technology issue. <laughs> um, so I think we're trying to do too much there. Sure, and and just to, uh, not in your perspective is awesome, but just in your sort of um, view of how things are moving, has anybody talked about doing that kind of thing in the school system? Because I know that it's not just going to be back to work, it's going to be back to school if they try to implement these apps. Um, um, say that one more time, I'm really sorry. Uh, the going so back I'm to school... So in other words, uh, do you, has anybody said, hey, we're going to install an app to do contact tracing in your school oh, system? No, not at all. Um, we, we do have some video cameras that are capable of uh, facial recognition and other capabilities, and those are completely turned off. Yeah. Um, we, we don't do anything along those lines. Now, there is one condition, um, and like, there's no way to stop this, right? A kid comes and vandalizes, and their phone, they had joined to the guest wireless, and so the next time that they come back to the sure. school, it hops on the wireless automatically. We, we do. We go back and look that kind of stuff up. Um, we have a full process on student investigation as well as staff investigations. Um, it basically says, you know, this request has to come from the administrator, specifically requesting that this investigation be done. What is the specific scope to it? And we will go and only pull the data that is absolutely necessary um, and then hand off the limited amount that we need to. Um, and that happens with law enforcement requests as well. Um, so we have those processes. I, I don't know that everybody else does. Um, I know that some do. Um, but I think your experience is going to be very, very widely dep depending on where you're at. The reason I ask is, is you know, there's a lot of people talking about getting the country back to work, so to speak, and so on. Um, and contact tracing is the way that they think they're going to do it. But even in best case scenario, right, um, we're going to have to contact trace children, <laughs> right? Um, kids are going to have to go back to school. So I have not heard a single murmur about it. So that's really interesting to me. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about it either. No requests that I've seen. And I would be really concerned trying to do that. Um, I think you would just assume that if the student was at school, there's your contact. Like we, we are required by law to take attendance. So if the student's there, I, I would consider them as, you know, having been exposed. So I do see a question from Mark down there. Um, I guess one, one area that I had intended to go through um, back when we were talking about um, kind of what an average school district looks like, uh, I had pulled up kind of like the, um, the federal funds that are granted to uh, different sizes of, of school districts and stuff. So, you know, we've got this uh, $656 million for New York City if we take a look at, you know, how much you know, funding and whatever that they're getting and all, all these different things. So go play around on this website. There's a ton of stuff that tells you about the funding models and how much school districts actually have. Um, building out uh, all, all of the infrastructure to do video conference hosting on premise, um, it, it's not a viable proposition and you still have to have administrative staff who understand how to build it up and actually maintain it. Um, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, if you take a look at, um, there's a revenue um, section here, but there's an average pay of teachers and you can expect your, uh, your staff to kind of fall in line with this. But like, if I'm a 15 year teacher, um, you know, I'm making 51,000 in South Carolina. Um, and that's with a master's degree, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, now just estimated average. There is one that's based on master's degree. Um, so if you go look at those numbers. So these are these are really complicated. Uh, the funding is um, oftentimes tied to, uh, you know, the state taxes, and sometimes that falls under estimation. Sometimes, per, you know, the employee retirement costs are astronomical, like they are here in, in Oregon. It's really affecting that. Um, it is a very, very hard model to play with and try to figure out how do we how do we properly fund so that we can actually build infrastructure that supports the, the privacy that everybody's concerned about because nobody wants to pay for it. Um, and I'd say pushing um, or advocate, advocating for uh, the home internet access is a big equity issue that we have right now. I, did, I forgot to mention it. We're sending all these devices home with kids, but some of them don't have internet. So then we're trying to rely on hotspots, but those aren't entirely available either, and they cost the district a lot of money. So I think at some point we really do have to talk about when does internet or broadband access become a public utility, because it has become a single point of failure for all of our teachers and students in order to actually educate them. Um, and it's really, really sad when you scroll down here and you look at the difference between, you know, white, white students in the city and black students in the city. 10% don't have internet access. 
Um, so definitely go take a look at these numbers. They're they're very <laughs> humbling and gives you a better concept, uh, you know, better understanding of a context behind it. So I was going to butt in, but my dog did it for me. So apologies. Um, thank you so much for engaging uh, with everybody in the public chat. Let's keep up this discussion. Um, obviously, you know uh, what you're doing is amazing, and people are very interested in it. Um, Nathan McNulty, security architect for Beaverton School District, um, OPSEC EDU does incredible, incredible work. So thank you so much for uh, presenting, and uh, let's keep up the convo.